Welcome everyone and thanks for joining the Kootenai Conservation Program's winter webinar series. This year our winter webinar series focuses on the theme of biodiversity in the Kootenays. And my name is Marcy Marr and I'm the stewardship coordinator and will be the host for today's webinar. Nicole Trigg, who's KCP's communications coordinator, is also on board to ensure our technology runs smoothly this morning. While some people are still joining us, I'd like to talk a bit about the Kootenai Conservation Program, known as KCP. We are a broad partnership founded in 2002 and currently comprised of more than 80 land and water conservation and stewardship groups, government agencies, resource industries, and agricultural producers working throughout the East and West Kootenays and Southeastern BC. And KCP's mandate is to coordinate and facilitate conservation efforts on private land and generate the support and resources necessary to maintain this effort. And we do this through increasing the effectiveness, collaboration, and coordination of private land securement, increasing the effectiveness and coordination of stewardship activities taking place on private lands, building financial and technical capacity for our partner organizations, and serving as a network to achieve efficiencies, synergies, and ultimately greater effectiveness. So I just want to uh, talk about our next uh, webinar that's coming up. And we have Valerie Huff from the Kootenai Native Plant Society on February 26th, who will be talking about why we should plant meadows, a systems approach to recovering pollinator pathways. And then uh, we have on March 4th, Clayton Lamb from the University of Calgary, who will be presenting an evidence to action approach for carnivore coexistence in adapt or die landscapes. And then we'll wrap up our webinar series on March 12th with our speaker, Corey Lawson of the Wildlife Conservation Society of Canada, whose talk will be back to the basics, reevaluating bat boxes based on bat needs. We're always very grateful to our funders and supporters uh, of the Kootenai Conservation Program without whom we, we couldn't do these, these types of activities. So I'd like to review some information about the webinar. Um, the webinar will be approximately 40 minutes with uh, 15 minutes of questions uh, and answers at the end. Uh, as an audience member, you'll be put on mute for the duration of the presentation, um, and this will uh, keep us from background noises and, and feedback uh, affecting um, everyone's experience. And if you're not familiar with Zoom, uh, take a moment to locate the control panel by hovering uh, your mouse over the bottom of the screen. And if you have questions about the presentation, click the Q&A option in the bottom toolbar and type in your question and they will be answered at the end of the presentation. And if you experience any technical difficulties, please click on the chat option in the bottom toolbar, uh, type in your question or comment, and uh, KCP communications coordinator Nicole Trigg will be monitoring the chat and will do her best to help you. This webinar will be recorded and made available uh, as a video on our website. And please expect a follow-up email tomorrow with the presenter's contact information, uh, a link to the webinar recording, and a short uh, post-webinar survey with just a few questions. And we hope you'll take a couple of minutes uh, and complete that survey because that gives us feedback um, to plan for next year's webinar series. So now I'd like to introduce Rachel Darville. Rachel is a registered professional biologist and principal consultant of GoldenEye Ecological Services based in Golden. And she's been working on bird research projects in the Columbia wetlands for the last five years. She'll be speaking about five different grebe species found in the Columbia Basin and will explain how to tell them apart in the field, where we can typically find them, and what kinds of habitats uh, they use and require. She'll also address how marsh birds like greaves can be important biological indicators of healthy wetland systems and may be useful in designating the Columbia wetlands an important bird and biodiversity area. So thank you, Rachel. Um, thanks for being our, our first speaker and kicking off our webinar series and I'll turn it over to you. Okay, thank you, Marcy. 
this up. Okay, thanks everybody. I'm happy that everyone was able to join me today. I probably know a number of you, so excited that you were able to log on. And as Marcy mentioned, my name is Rachel Darville. I'm the Principal Consultant of GoldenEye Ecological Services. And today I will speak to you about a number of items. I'll describe some of the bird research projects that I've been working on for the past five years in the Columbia wetlands, how my research relates to um, grebes and habitat conservation in the wetlands, how you can identify these grebe species in the field and where we can typically find them, what kinds of habitats they require. And I'll also speak, speak to the listed status of each of the five grebe species that I'll be talking about today. Uh, before I get started here, I'd like to thank the organizations that have contributed funds to the two bird research projects that I've been working on for the past five years. These projects would certainly not be possible without the generous funding contributions of these organizations that have allowed me to spend time in the field learning about these birds, learning about grebes, and collecting a num uh, uh, an, an extremely large data set at this point and formulating uh, recommendations to protect water bird habitat of the Columbia wetlands. And bes before I speak about grebes, I would like to tell you a little bit about the ecosystem that I've been working in um, so that you have a good sense for um, where we're conducting this research. Oh, sorry. So the Columbia wetlands is one of the longest intact wetlands in all of North America, a contiguous wetland ecosystem that's approximately 26,000 hectares in size. It stretches approximately 180 kilometers in length, and it's one to, five, one to three kilometers across, depending on where you are located within the ecosystem. It is the only undammed stretch of the Columbia River that remains, and it provides essential habitat for a number of different fish and wildlife species, including some that are imperiled or at risk, as well as migratory and resident birds. It is considered to be a vital component of the Pacific Flyway, which is a major north-south flyway route in America. We know now that there are at least 30 at-risk bird species that utilize Columbia wetlands habitat, including the barn swallow, the common nighthawk, American bittern, as well as three of the grebe species that I'll be speaking about today. The Columbia wetlands does have a few different conservation designations in specific parts of the wetlands. Well, first off, uh, the Ramsar designation. In, in 2004, the non-governmental organization WildSite made an application to designate the Columbia wetlands with Ramsar status. And in 2005, it received that status. So this means it's not recognized as a wetland with international significance. About 69% of the Columbia wetlands has been designated as the Columbia Wetlands Wildlife Management Area. And that portion of the wetlands is under the jurisdiction and management of the provincial government, the Ministry of Forest Lands, Natural Resource Operations and Rural Development. There are four parcels in the Columbia wetlands that are called the Columbia National Wildlife Area, including the Wilmer unit and three other smaller units. And this um, area is managed by the federal government, the Canadian Wildlife Service, but is actually owned by the Nature Trust of BC and is leased to the federal government for their management. There is a provincial park in the northern end of the Columbia wetlands called Burgess and James Gatson Provincial Park, which is managed by BC Parks. And there are some additional conservation parcels within the Columbia wetlands that are owned by the Nature Trust of BC and the or the Nature Trust of Canada. And this um, provides you sort of with an aerial overview. I took this photograph when I was conducting an aerial survey for water birds um, during fall migration. And you can see that the wetlands are here are in the foreground and are adjacent to the riparian forests and the um, forested benchlands and extends up into the Purcell mountain range. So to tell you a little bit about one of these bird research projects that I've been working on, the first is the Columbia Wetlands Water Bird Survey Project, which was a five-year coordinated bird count that ran from 2015 to 2019. There were sort of three major overarching goals of that particular project, and it was a project of WildSite Golden. 
So first off, the project worked to provide a citizen science opportunity for residents that live in the Columbia Valley. Although we did have some participants that came as far as Calgary and some from Canmore and um, Cranbrook as well. We had about 240, 230 participants in that project over the five year period. It also worked to build increased appreciation and recognition for both birds and the Columbia wetlands ecosystem by providing a number of different types of diverse educational opportunities, such as training modules to teach volunteers how to identify water birds and count water birds in the field, as well as bird walks, um, setting up booths at farmers markets and giving presentations to a number of different types of um, interest groups. And then of course, we also worked to collect uh, baseline data on birds that prior to this project was significantly lacking for the Columbia wetlands. And this data has and will be used to inform future habitat conservation projects. And it's also being used, uh, the data is being used to nominate the Columbia wetlands into the important bird and diversity area program. So the important bird and biodiversity area program is also known as an IBA. And uh, this is a science-based initiative. So it's a global initiative and it works to identify, conserve, and monitor a network of sites across the globe that provide the most essential habitat for birds. This designation uh, helps to promote the international collaboration for the conservation of our world's birds. Uh, these sites hold significant conservation value and by protecting IBAs, it helps to ensure that we have a future for our world's birds. Uh, you may be familiar with the recent report that came out in 2019 that stated that 2.9 billion birds are now gone from North America alone since 1970. So these IBAs are really irreplaceable habitat. There's approximately 10,000 of these sites that have been identified across the globe, uh, about 600 in Canada and 83 in British Columbia. And they have been designated as such uh, because significant numbers of birds are congregating while breeding or during migration and or because they contain birds which are threatened. And for species that tend to congregate in large numbers, the threshold is often 1% of its global or regional uh, population. So once, once achieved, the IVA status can help achieve uh, conservation objectives and it can also be good for the local economy because globally the, the birding world is growing. People are getting really interested in birds, which is a great thing. Uh, there are specific trigger species that we thought would, could have the potential to trigger IBA status for the Columbia wetlands prior to initiating the Columbia Wetlands Water Bird Survey Project. And these are some of these species. So you can see that there are four different group species that were listed with numbers beside them. So that's essentially the threshold or 1% of the um, continental or regional population for those birds. So to give you um, an example, for the trumpeter swan, if we were to see three, approximately 340 individuals on any given day, then that would trigger the threshold um, for the IBA with the trumpeter swan species. And you need to uh, meet that, that criteria or trigger these thresholds for at least five consecutive years. And that's why the Columbia Wetlands Water Bird Survey Project was a five-year project. This gives you a snapshot for where IBAs are distribu distributed across the province of British Columbia. You can see that most of them are on the coast, largely because they provide important shorebird habitat and or seabird habitat, so large congregations of uh, breeding or, or um, resting shorebirds on the coast. But we also have two IBAs in the Columbia Basin. So one is at the Creston Valley Wildlife Management Area and the other is located north of Cranbrook in the Skookumchuk area. And that particular Skookumchuk IBA was designated as such because of the habitat values that they, it provides to uh, the threatened species, Lewis's woodpeckers and long-billed curlews. And on is the Columbia Wildlands Bird Monitoring Project. So this was a project that I worked on in collaboration with the Canadian Wildlife Service and financial support was also graciously supported, uh, provided rather by the Fish and Wildlife Compensation Program. The main objectives of, of this particular project were to address information gaps on marsh birds in the Columbia wetlands, to form population estimates, and to identify important breeding areas 
or habitat types in the Columbia wetlands. We had five focal species, uh, which were the American coot, the American bittern, high-billed grebe, the sora, and the Virginia rail. Uh, the American bittern and the sora are pictured here. Uh, but we did manage to um, detect approximately 120 different species. So we were recording all of the species that we could hear and see. We conducted repeated surveys at 65 different monitoring stations throughout the wetlands. And this was over a four year period. So from 2016 and to 2019. And I will be doing some more marsh bird monitoring this year, it turns out as well. Uh, what we did is use broadcast, broadcast units um, to play the recordings for those five focal birds in order to elicit a response in these birds that are quite secretive and elusive and, and they're not easily uh, detected through observation alone. We also conducted habitat monitoring at each of the survey stations and during those uh, habitat um, surveys we basically reported on major habitat types at each of the survey stations including the per percent of open water, percent of emergent herbaceous vegetation, as well as uh, dominant species of vegetation at the sites. This type of baseline data was needed to assess threats to marsh birds, as well as to make uh, management recommendations for um, conserving marsh birds in the Columbia wetlands, including grebes. And we also worked to identify uh, potential restoration opportunities in the Columbia wetlands. This view for where the service stations are located, uh, so the most southerly location was at the north end of Columbia Lake and survey stations were distributed um, throughout the system were accessed either through ground-based methods or with a kayak and they extended all the way up to the Burgess and James Gatson Provincial Park uh, which is located north of Golden and is locally, no locally known as uh, the Moberly Marsh. Including grebes, rails, bitterns, and snipe, and others that typically inhabit dense emergent wetlands. They're secretive and, and elusive, as I'd mentioned, which makes them quite difficult to detect in combination with their cryptic coloration. So you can see in the bottom right hand photograph there, there's actually a pied billed grebe hiding in there. And so you can see that they're pretty secretive and, and challenging to see. And this one was coming close because I had elicited its response using that broadcasting equipment. So often they don't come out and they're not even often that visible during the breeding season. I also wanted to point out there that um, yellow-headed blackbird, while not a focal species of the marsh bird monitoring project or officially classified as a marsh bird, it does utilize marsh bird habitat. So this would be one of the um, additional species that we counted and observed during the uh, monitoring project and it's considered to be um, an important component to the marsh bird monitoring project, a good indicator species. Um, oops, sorry, I just jumped ahead there. Uh, there are, or sorry, with the um, marsh birds, there's generally little known about these particular species because they are secretive and elusive. But um, globally speaking, a number of these birds are thought to be on the decline. To provide an example, the horned grebe was recently uplisted by the International Union for the Conservation of Nature or the IUCN to be a vulnerable species, which is um, one step below endangered at the IUCN level. The project we felt that a number of marsh bird species use the Columbia wetlands to breed but population and um, population sizes and locations of important breeding habitat were unknown. And there are a number of threats to the Columbia wetlands ecosystem, even though it is still relatively intact, such as climate change, increased levels of recreation that can lead to things like egg loss, nest abandonment, trampling of vegetation from things like cattle and dogs, as well as rural So birds such as grebes, ospreys, and a number of other birds across the world have been used as ecological indicators. And they can be really great at indicating change to habitat. One of the most useful things that um, birds can indicate is overall habitat quality. So to help assess ecosystem impacts and um, ecosystem health, quantifying change in species abundance for birds is essential. Birds are really dependent on the habitat functioning in specific ways and the population trends of birds can tell us how well the ecosystem is functioning. For instance, if numbers of marsh birds are nesting, or sorry, numbers of marsh birds are nesting in the Columbia wetlands 
are dependent upon prey availability. And potential impacts to wetlands can degrade habitat quality, which will lead to less prey availability that the marsh birds need, and they will cause population declines. And um, that recent study that I had mentioned in 2019 that came out that spoke to the 2.9 um, billion bird population decline uh, stated that birds are excellent indicators of environmental health and ecosystem integrity and our ability to monitor many bird species over vast spatial scales far exceeds that of any other animal group. So they're incredibly useful, especially these um, large scale data sets that are coming out like eBird, which again, which uh, allows you to look over vast spatial scales. Evaluating magnitude of population declines can be challenging because it really requires monitoring over the long term, which can be problematic when it comes to um, resource constraints such as uh, funding and time. Um, so what are grebes? Well, I have some pictured here and they're small to medium sized birds. They're really amazing birds. And um, if I was more savvy with Zoom, I would have um, loaded up some uh, vocalizations for you guys. But for those of you not familiar with grief vocalizations, after this webinar, I highly recommend listening to some of their vocalizations. They're very unique and really cool as far as I'm concerned. Um, so these birds are foot propelled underwater. They're not wing propelled. So they, they um, can swim really effectively. They're excellent swimmers and divers that are using their feet to swim, these lobe toed feet. They have narrow wings that are, um, and their feet I should say are, plas are placed very far back on their body. So um, awkwardly far back on their body, which makes walking very difficult for them and take off from land virtually impossible. Their body is quite short and depending on the species, uh, they have a variably long neck as well. During the breeding season, uh, they are quite ornate and, and quite distinctive with beautiful colorful plumes. But during the non-breeding season, they're rather plain and drab, and they tend to have more gray and white coloration. All species of grebe are monogamous and lack apparent sexual dimorphism, meaning that they breed for life, essentially, or they mate for life, I should say, essentially, and um, the males and females look the same. Their preferred breeding habitat includes shallow freshwater lakes and large open water bodies. And one of the main reasons for this is that they need ample water off of water and taking to the air. So they need about 50 to 60 meters of running taxi distance in order to get off the water. The nests are built of floating and emergent vegetation that is anchored in shallow water and the floating nests may be located on open water or in sheltered um, emergent vegetation. Greaves are able to adjust their buoyancy which is really interesting. So by modifying the way that their feathers lay on their body, uh, greaves to their own buoyancy, much like a submarine. So it gives them the ability to sink really quickly and quietly beneath the surface with, with really barely a ripple on the water. It's a rather neat and bizarre adaptation and it's really fun to watch. This allows them to swim in the water with just their neck and head exposed. The juveniles of most species have striped faces and the young are often carried on their parents' back when they're small. And adults may even swim underwater with the young on their back. And you can see the, pot, the program from the bottom right shows um, redneck grebe carrying two chicks on the back. Grebes are mostly migratory and they're usually found wintering on salt water on the ocean and breeding colonially or solitary in shallow or reedy freshwater habitats. Their food often includes fish as well as aquatic invertebrates and some plant materials. And for uncertain reasons, uh, feathers are often swallowed. Although, although there are some theories as to why feathers followed. There are 22 species of grebe worldwide. We have six in the Columbia Basin, but I won't be speaking to Clark's grebe. Uh, they're they're uh, not found in the Columbia wetlands, and, and so I'm not familiar with that species, so I won't be speaking to them today, but they look very similar to a Western grebe. And grebes use large open water bodies as stopover habitat during migration. And in the Columbia wetlands here, we found that Columbia Lake and Lake Windermere in particular, as well as other large open water bodies of the Columbia wetlands tend to uh, be great habitat for grebes during migration. And this photograph here shows uh, Columbia wetlands, 
Um, and there's a number of different bird spe species here, but there are some um, western grebe and, and pied-billed grebe scattered amongst uh, mostly waterfowl. So this is what a large mixed flock looks like on these shallow open water bodies of the Columbia wetlands. This shows you the five grebes that we get here in the Columbia Basin in greeting plumage. But again, I do not have a photograph of the um, Clark's grebe. So we've got the red neck grebe that has a long red neck, a white ear, um, patch on its cheek. And this, um, they all really have sharp long bills that are well adapted for eating fish. Um, the western grebe is here with this long white neck and the horned grebe and the eared grebe look somewhat similar, although the horned grebe has this thick tuft of yellow feathers coming off of the eyes, whereas the eared grebe has more wispy um, feathers coming off of behind the eye. And they're more delicate looking and they're smaller. And then the pied-billed grebe is a, is, has a different bill shape compared to the other grebe, so it's more chunky and stout. And during the breeding season, it has that stripe around its bill. And I'll go through all of these species individually. So for the redneck grebe, I'd mentioned that, I mean, and as the name suggests, the long red neck is really a striking identifying feature of this particular species. And the bill is yellow and gray in color. Uh, it's, it's quite a large grebe. It's second only in size to the Western grebe. And it's got a really unique call um, that I recommend listening to after the webinar or when you have time. These birds are normally solitary nesters, but occasionally they'll, nest in loose colonies. Their breeding distribution is widespread throughout British Columbia except in the northern part of the province. In the Columbia wetlands they're normally found nesting in open water bodies that have yellow pond lilies so they use those floating pond lilies to um, weave their floating nests. And they use large open water bodies like the other grebes as stopover habitat during migration and again especially Columbia Lake and Lake Windermere here in the Columbia Valley. Their diet is comprised mainly of fish and crustaceans. And this particular species is not a species at risk, but more intensive surveys are required to see how their population is doing. Some declines may be occurring in southern BC according to the BC Breeding Bird Atlas, which was a survey that took place between the years of 2008 and 2012. Then we've got the western grebe, which is the largest grebe in British Columbia. Beautiful bird um, with a long white neck, clean white neck and a black stri stripe down the back of the neck, which makes this um, identif these identifying features very distinctive for this particular species. Again, this long, sharp, pointy bill, which is very diagnostic of a grebe. Um, and they, they perform a really spectacular breeding or courtship display in their breeding territories. And you can see that they're doing this um, beautiful courtship dance in the photograph that's um, pictured down in the um, left hand corner of the screen. But there are only a few places in British Columbia where rest western grebes breed. So the Creston Valley is, is one area where western grebes breed, but Salmon Arm Bay, uh, Shushwap Lake, has the largest colony of western grebes in British Columbia. These birds tend to nest among reed canary grass, cattails, or over submerged water milfoils on freshwater lakes. And these birds are really fish specialists. They mainly take fish, but they also take salamanders, crustaceans, and insects. The western grebe is red listed in British Columbia. So it's um, on the highest level of, of being at risk on the provincial scale. And they've been red listed since 1992. And COSIWIC, or the Committee on the Status of Endangered Wildlife in Canada, um, listed this species to be of special concern in 2014. Then we've got the cute little bird, um, small and pinky. It's brownish gray color overall. It doesn't have that bright colorful plumage like you'd see at the eared grebe or the horned grebe. And um, during the breeding season, I'd mentioned it has that stripe around the bill, as you see in the upper right hand corner. But um, during the non-breeding season, you don't see that stripe as um, is photographed in the bottom left-hand corner. This bird, like other grebes, build floating nests, as you can see in the photograph on the bottom right, with three chicks in the striped head. And again, these floating nests are barely above the water, but they continually add to their nests um, during the nesting season. And this particular species is not at risk either. 
And then we've got the eared grebe. So the eared grebe is the most abundant grebe in North America and in fact the world. And not here in the Columbia Valley, but in the world. So these birds have wispy yellow ear feathers and they're smaller and more delicate looking than the horned grebe. They're small, highly social birds that breed in colonies that number into the low 1000s. A really uh, cool fact about these birds is that almost the entire population of eared grebes, the world's population of eared grebes, flies to two locations, Mono Lake in California, or Great Salt Lake in Utah. And that's where this photograph was taken in Great Salt Lake. And they go to those areas to fatten up on um, brine, strip, and alkali flies before migrating further south. Here they more than double their body weight. And so these birds will spend up to nine to 10 months of the year flightless. Uh, this is the longest flightless period of any bird in the world that is capable of flight. And during this time, they're flightless because they're going through multiple changes in body mass and changes in internal digestive organs. So it's really, really cool. They've got really interesting and unique biology. And if you want to learn more about the biology of the eared grebe, there's um, ample information online about them. The eared grebes, like other grebes, are habitats of shallow freshwater um, marshes, ponds, and lakes with emergent vegetation and an abundance of macroinvertebrates for food. And of course, they use uh, large open water bodies as stopover habitat as well. And here in the Columbia Valley, we found again that Columbia Lake and Lake Windermere, as well as other, um, well, those two lakes in particular for the eared grebe is where we tend to find them. Uh, provincially, the species is blue listed and they have not been assessed by Kosiwik. Then we have the horned grebe. So this is the last of five grebe species that I'll be speaking about today. Um, this particular grebe species is monogamous. Um, all grebe species tend to be monogamous, so they mate for life. This one is largely territorial, and uh, the horned grebe usually nests solitarily and occasionally in small colonies. This particular species performs intricate courtship displays in its breeding habitat as well. It builds cryptic floating nests of emergent vegetation, and this type of emergent vegetation that these grebes tend to like is, are things like cattail, bulrush, sedge, and horsetail. In migration, stopover sites are, are medium to large in size, over 1,000 hectares. And um, uh, the horned grebe is yellow listed in the province of British Columbia. And this has a species of special concern in 2009 due to ongoing, wide-ranging, long-term declines. The horned grebe is also listed as a, special, a species of special concern under SARA, which is the Federal Species at Risk Act. And through that BC breeding bird survey that took place in two, from 2008 to 2012, there was sparse data available that, or sparse data that came in for the horned grebe, suggesting that there may be steeper declines for horned grebes in British Columbia compared to elsewhere in Canada. And threats to um, this particular species include wetland loss during droughts, degradation of wetland breeding sites, and increasing nest predators. So these, uh, this is an uh, image of the uh, grebes in their non-breeding plumage. So you can see that they all really have a similar shape. And they all are rather drab, so they tend to be sort of gray and white in color, maybe a bit of brownish in there. So they really can be similar in their non-breeding plumage. And you have to pay special attention when you're identifying these guys. You want to pay attention to, the, to their, to their um, small differences in shape, to the bill color, to the eye color, and where the white occurs. So uh, the where the white occurs is, is particularly really um, significant with uh, when trying to differentiate between the horned grebe and the eared grebe. And I'm gonna be showing you a slide dedicated just to those species and show you the subtle differences between the two of them. But you can see the horned grebe here, the redneck grebe, western grebe, common loon, eared grebe, and the pied-billed grebe. So I snuck the common loon in there because uh, I think it can sometimes be confused with the grebe species. It does kind of have a similar shape. It has a bill like the grebe species, but the common loon is much larger than any of the grebes. 
And so if you're out there and you're watching birds or if you're a beginner, if you see something that uh, a species that's really quite large and you think it, it's a, a grebe, look closer and see, does it have the distinguishing features, all the distinguishing features that you're looking for? And if not, then maybe you might be something looking at something like a common loon. Other species that get confused with grebes during the non-breeding season include the hooded merganser um, and sometimes the pelagic comorant, comorant, or the double-crested comorant, rather. <clears throat> okay, so the horned grebe and the eared grebe. So with the horned grebe, which we see on the left, you can see that the cheek of this particular bird and everything um, on the face below the line of the eye is really clean white. And the front of the neck is really white as well. The head crown on the horned grebe is right, and where the peak of the body is held on the back. For the horned grebe, it's more well-rounded as well. In comparison to the eared grebe, where the peak of the back tends to be held um, near, the, near the rear end of the bird. The eared grebe has dark on the face below the line drawn with the eye. It has a dusky neck, so you don't get that clean white cheek and the clean white neck. And you tend to get a peaked crown on the head above the eye. And sometimes you'll see a white ear patch on, a, on the eared grebe as well, which you can see in the uppermost and bottommost photograph on the eared grebe side. So of course, um, in during, um, depending on what time of season you're looking at a bird, they can have variable plumage. And certainly the eared grebe during the non-breeding season um, it will have different variations during, um, during that season. So there, uh, again, are three grebe species at risk that we covered. The pied-billed grebe and the redneck grebe are not at risk. The eared grebe is provincially listed as a blue listed species, but it is not listed as a species of concern under Kosiwik or SARA. And the IUCN or the International Union for the Conservation of Nature lists the eared grebe as a species of least concern. The horned grebe in the province of British Columbia is considered to not be at risk. So it is a yellow listed species, but under Kosiwik and SARA, uh, they both consider that species to be a species of special concern. And the IUCN lists that particular grebe species, the horned grebe, to be the most at risk globally, and they list it with the vulnerable status, which is only one step below endangered status on their red list. And then the western grebe uh, is considered to be the most endangered by the province of British Columbia within British Columbia itself. Kosiwit considers it to be a species of special concern, as does SARA, and the IUCN um, considers it to be of least concern. So the Water Survey, uh, the survey dates tend to occur in the fall, or they do occur in the fall and the spring, but they occur a little bit ahead of when the peak migration occurs for the grebes through the Columbia Valley, both in the spring and the fall. And so we didn't get a lot of records for grebes because of that, but we did get some. So we had 15 records for the eared grebe, 53 for the horned grebe, um, 34 for the eared horn, because it's difficult to tell the difference between the two of them, 67 for the western grebe. Additionally, we've been looking at um, eBird records, and there's a number of um, at-risk grebe records in there, which can be useful for helping you determine what types of habitat is in for these species during migration or during breeding, depending on where you are. But here in the Columbia wetlands, we don't get breeding western grebes. And um, the horned grebe, I'm not familiar with any locations for breeding horned grebes. And with the eared grebe, we only found one location when they were, where they were breeding. But we do seem to get a fair number of them during migration. And for these particular areas where we are getting high concentrations of at-risk grebe species, as well as other types of water birds, I recommend the Columbia Water Bird Survey to protect the stopover habitat using migratory bird sanctuary designation status. I'm working on another project now through the Columbia Wetland Stewardship Partners in Kootenai Connect, where I'm doing a lot of eBird data mining. And so I was speaking about this a little bit in the last slide, but there are a number of additional records there that can be useful for helping you identify where you should be focusing your efforts in conserving uh, stopover habitat, in our case. These are the model average 
system has local marsh bird species through the uh, marsh bird monitoring project. And you can see the pied billed grebe, um, if you look at the abundance estimates columns, came out with numbers between 887 individuals and 1,216. Uh, you may recall that the IVA threshold is often 1% of a species global or regional population, and for pied-billed grebes, that's approximately 1,000 to 1,200 individuals. So through the Marsh Bird Monitoring Project and the abundance estimates that we made for pied-billed grebes, we're using those estimates to nominate the Columbia wetlands into the IBA program. So additional habitat conservation actions and recommendations that have been made because of these projects, I'm gonna cover some of them now. Um, first off, I want to explain that the ideal breeding habitat for marsh birds tends to be this condition called the hemi marsh condition. So this is where you'll get the well interspersed 50 to 50 vegetative cover to water ratio. And in these types of areas, you'll find higher densities and diversities of marsh birds and wetlands. And the rationale for this is because you'll get increased abundance and availability of food, and it also allows for the visual isolation of breeding birds. There's one area in the Columbia Valley called Reflection Lake, where we're essentially starting to get a cattail monoculture. So this is not uh, very well used, it's too dense. Um, and this cattail removes the open water that's needed by birds to forage and move around. And it also creates anaerobic conditions, which leads to little to no invertebrate productivity and invertebrates are needed by birds um, for food, of course. Reflection Lake has been documented as important breeding habitat for a number of different uh, marsh bird species. And this is in the habitat of Reflection Lake that is away from that cattail monoc monoculture. And these increases in cattail growth, which you can see on the right, in the case of Reflection Lake, are really owing to um, the creation of the uh, adjacent highway and the CP rail yard. So it's essentially cut off the natural hydrological flow regime. So there's no silver bullet for, for removing this cattail, but um, Dr. Catherine Tarasoff out of the Thompson Rivers University has been successful at using barriers to reduce the stature of an invasive called yellow flag iris. And so we're doing some experimental cattail manipulations using Dr. Tarasoff's approach to work to restore the hemi-marsh condition at Reflection Lake. So we've removed some cattails from test plots, installed benthic barriers. We're gonna leave those benthic barriers down for approximately one year, conduct vegetation and marsh bird surveys before has already happened, and then we're gonna do it after we remove the mats. And some of those removed cattails have been brought to the Akiskit Kiskanuk First Nation in Windermere, where um, some traditional cultural practices were relearned with an elder, Lillian Rose, where the Akiskanuk community was invited to uh, participate in a basket making, uh, basket um, weaving workshop that Lillian Rose led. Also, the College of the Rocky students were involved in um, doing the on the ground work to um, re remove some of the cattail and install these um, test plots. We've also been working to install nesting boxes, not for grebe species, of course, but for other uh, water birds that utilize Columbia wetlands habitat for breeding. And I want to point out too that grebes have been useful for developing the boating regulations that the Columbia wetlands currently have. So um, currently there's no motorized vessels allowed in the wetlands portion of the Columbia River wetlands. They're restricted to the main channel. There's also a prohibition on the towing of persons on water skis or other equipment in the main channel of the Columbia River. And uh, the final piece of the regulation states that those vessels on the main channel are limited to a motor of an engine with 15 kilowatts or less. And so all of these things help to reduce impact to birds as well um, on the main channel it helps to reduce the amount of wake that can be damaging, especially to birds like grebes that build floating nests. And you can see the photograph here, there's an um, at-risk horned grebe uh, flying away from uh, some motorized users that were, um, that were uh, water skiing at the south end of Lake Windermere, Lake, or sorry, Columbia Lake in the spring of 2019. Additional recommendations that have come from the two projects include repeating the Columbia Wetlands Marsh Bird Monitoring Project at least every three to five years at a minimum in order to determine the status of any population changes using marsh birds as indicator species. 
Further wetland restoration enhancement projects will be pursued, installing additional nesting boxes on lands, especially where land or have limit according to best management practices. The nesting box is six feet off the ground on a freestanding pole and with a predator guard in place. And upon completion of habitat mapping, uh, we'll work to identify areas of emergent vegetation in the Columbia wetlands because those have been areas that um, we've learned are most important for protecting marsh bird breeding habitat, including um, for grebes. Also expanding the Columbia Wetlands Wildlife Management Area boundaries where possible. Promoting best management practices in wetlands such as cattle exclusion, fencing, offsite watering. And all pri privately owned parcels within the Columbia Wetlands uh, are recommended to be considered for land acquisition for conservation purposes when possible. Also the promotion of the Kootenai Conservation Program Stewardship Solutions Toolkit, which is available online for private landowners. And then lastly, um, there are a wide range of potentially detrimental behavioral patterns that have been documented for water birds in response to recreationalists, such as increased flushing and flight times and energy expenditure by birds reduces their overall energy intake. There's reduced foraging and resting periods that come about, increased nest abandonment and egg loss, discouragement of late nesting pairs from breeding, disruption of pair bonds and parent offspring bonds, and repeat disturbances such as this eventually cause water birds, including grebes, to nest elsewhere or, no, or not at all. So I recommend that there be widespread public education regarding the impacts to water birds, including grebes, from recreation and to reduce or significantly limit all traffic, including non-motorized recreational traffic, in or near emergent vegetation that is critical during life stages for birds. Okay, well, thank you so much, Rachel. That was really interesting uh, and good luck with the IBA designation and all the work you're doing behind the scenes to, to make that happen. Um, and I just want to thank everybody else who's joined us today. Uh, we, we had, a, I think, a good session. I hope you enjoyed it. And you'll get a follow-up email tomorrow with a link to an online post-webinar survey take you just a few minutes it's just a few questions but we appreciate your feedback it helps us develop our future webinar series you'll find a link to this video uh, you'll find a link to rachel's uh, waterbird survey um, the report culminating of five years of her work there and i also want to remind you of our next webinar on february 26th um, about planting meadows and a system approach to recovering pollinator pathways with valerie Hupp. Um, and so Thank you very much again and enjoy the rest of your day.